All right, gather around, you mixed mangling poo heads. If you believe metal mixing is all about just twiddling knobs and praying to the ancient gods of distortion, you're sorely mistaken. You're about to undergo a transformation from clueless knob twiddler to sonic alchemist because... <laughs> All right, enough beating around the bush. You're not here to sprinkle fairy dust on your mixes and hope for the best. You crave that bone crunching clarity, that gut to the punch, and that wall of sound so monumental that the ancient gods bow down in agreement. However, a great mix starts way before jumping into any EQ or compression. It all starts with your preparation of your tracks. Before we even think about mixing, take a good hard look at your song's arrangement. Is it more tangled than a headphone cord in your pocket? Well, you need an intervention. A coherent arrangement is a non-negotiable. It's the bedrock of a great mix. The goal with mixing is to enhance your track, not to try to perform miracles on a doomed arrangement. Here are three steps to make sure that your arrangement is up to par. Step one, introduce dynamic contrast. Introduce variation in riffs, verses, choruses, and outros to keep the listener engaged all throughout your song. Step two, instrumentation. Be deliberate about what instruments play what and when. Overcrowding and stacking too many things going on at once leads to a muddy mix and overloads the listener by having their brain focus on way too many things at once. And step three, create space by reduction. Allow moments of minimalism to give listeners a break and to emphasize impact on sections where you want the impact to be big. All right, now that we solidified our arrangement, it's time to get our guitars and drums prepped. If you're like me, you're probably working with MIDI drums. So you need to separate your MIDI drums into each individual pieces. That means kick, snare, toms, overheads, and room mics all get their own separate track. This allows us to mix each individual element of the drum kit, building on top of one another to ultimately make one instrument, which is just the drums. You're probably wondering, why can't I just do that with the stereo track of all my drums together? Well, when you separate your tracks, you can EQ, compress, add saturation, or do any other amount of processing you need on the individual level of the tracks, as well as create panning for the toms and overheads that you just can't do with the stereo drum track. It also helps a ton when it comes down to automation, when you need to make sure that the blast beats get put up a little bit, or when the double kick kicks in that you bring it down in volume so that it doesn't overload your speakers. This separation is vital for all of these elements, which is something that a stereo drum track can never provide. Step two, separating your rhythm guitars. All right, you need to track individual rhythm guitars and as well as leads. That means if you have two rhythm guitar tracks, one left and one right, make sure that each of them get one mono track each. At first glance, printing them down to a stereo file may seem like a great time saver, but ultimately you're boxing yourself in. You might need to change the EQ on just one side or automate the other side, and you're not gonna be able to do that with just a stereo file. Step three, editing and cleanup. Now that you've recorded your guitar tracks to individual mono files, it's time to edit them. Meticulously comb through them, editing any clicks, pops, and bad takes out of the equation. This cleanup phase is your last line of defense between amateur hour and pro mix results. Next up is commitment. Now that we've separated our drum tracks, chosen our drum sounds, edited our guitar tracks, it's time to commit our amp sims and drums to audio. This critical step moves you from a maybe to this is it, I'm gonna jump right into mixing. It also is gonna save your CPU from a meltdown later down the line when you're having so many plugins that you don't know what to do with. Here are three steps for committing like you mean it. Finalize the edits in your guitar tracks from the previous section. Double check that all your crossfades are put in their proper places and make sure that you're not getting any doubled notes or gaps. If you are, go back and re-record your guitars. Step two, commit your amp sims after finalizing your edits. You need to pick a guitar tone and just roll with it. Later down the line, you're gonna learn what is a good guitar tone and a bad guitar tone, but you're never gonna get there if you constantly have the option to go back and tweak it. Commit your amp sims to audio and start mixing, make mistakes and learn from them. Step three, print your drums into audio. Now that we separated each individual piece of the kit, it's time to print the audio tracks. That means kick, snare, toms, mics, and overheads all get their individual tracks, as well as synthesizers, choirs, and any other elements like symphonies, brass elements, or post-production effects being printed down to audio. It's time to get organized. Start naming your tracks with precisions using a numerical system, ascending up the numerical ladder for each track of the mix. This is about having a numbered system that allows you to find your tracks quickly and efficiently. You don't wanna be playing Where's Waldo with your tracks when you're in the middle of a great mix. Here are three steps for naming and numbering your tracks. Step one, begin with numbers starting with double zero. I personally like to move from drums, 
bass, guitars, vocals, and then any auxiliary tracks such as symphonic elements, synthesizers, or post-production effects. Naming each track numerically in order until I get to the very end, making sure that each track has its own individual number. Step two, after you've numbered your tracks, it's time to actually name them. So for kick, you're gonna just call it kick. But for lead guitars, don't call it John Solo. Instead, call it lead guitar one. By using clear names such as this, it's gonna lead to a much clearer idea of what to do with the tracks once you get your hands on them. Step number three, utilize color coding. I like to organize my sessions via color coding on top of everything else, with drums being blue, bass being purple, guitars being green, vocals being yellow, and anything else being orange. This quickly allows me to identify certain groups and areas of the mix with just colors without having to actually read any of the names of the tracks, allowing me to work a lot faster. Alright, the final step before diving into a mix, exporting. We need to ensure that every track starts at the same point and ends at the same point. We also are going to export our tracks at 44.1 or 48 kilohertz at 24 bit depth. This has long been settled as the standard for audio mixing. This is also a great time to include your tempo maps and your map markers to import into your mixing session. They're going to give you a crucial mapping system allowing you to navigate your song's arrangement very quickly and efficiently. And there you have it. You're done. You have exported your tracks to a professional level. You're no longer a mixing novice, but you're on your way to be a metal mixing master. And if you still need help after all of this and you're ready to level up, click the link below and book a free call with me. I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching personalized to your goals. So if you want to level up your mixing skills, click the link below and book that call. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.